Tranquility du jour, March 4th, 2019. Restore and reflect while nurturing your creative spirit at a gorgeous secluded villa nestled on an Italian hilltop. Indulge in daily yoga, Tuscan cuisine, a Puccini opera, and the magic of Cinque Terre. Join me this July for tranquility in Tuscany. Learn more at KimberlyWilson.com slash Italy. Hello there, this is Kimberly Wilson, and welcome to the 446th edition of Tranquility Du Jour. In this week's edition, I have the pleasure of chatting with Jennifer Skiff, and we discuss stories from her latest book, Rescuing Ladybugs, of people who didn't look away from seemingly impossible to change situations and instead worked to save animals. You can follow along in the show notes at KimberlyWilson.com slash 446. Also, for any of you who are new to Tranquility Du Jour, you can find out more about us over in the show notes. There's a Learn More Here link. And then also join our bi-weekly love notes and get access to Tranquil Treasures, which is an assortment of PDFs, MP3s, and videos to ideally spread a little bit more tranquility into our everyday. And also, I will be sending out a love note this week, so be sure to sign up if you're not yet on the list. And before I dive in to chatting with Jennifer, I want to share a few things that are coming up. First, on Friday. It is International Women's Day, March 8th. And at 8 p.m., I'm hosting a Year of Tranquility online book launch fet. And so it'll be a one-hour gathering where we're going to have a fun little guidebook to go along with it and just a way to connect. And so anyone who has gotten the book from Amazon or through me as a PDF, you can sign up for this and get access to it. So basically go to KimberlyWilson.com slash Y-O-T. And then click on the piece about the treats that takes you to a form where you put in the information. And then voila, you are taken to five bonuses, including this event. And don't worry if you can't join us live and you have access to all the bonuses. Well, you can definitely watch it at your own time within about 48 hours later. So I'm so excited to be with you guys for this event on Friday. Also, our next live event is coming up on Sunday, March 24th, and that's our seasonal TDJ Live to welcome and honor the spring season. So again, that's a free event from 8 to 9 p.m., and you can sign up for that in the show notes or at KimberlyWilson.com. Two other fun events that are happening that are Pigs and Pugs project related. Pigs, Pugs, and Pino on April 28th, and then Yoga and the Animals on June 8th. All the proceeds from this benefit Pigs and Pugs project, which ultimately goes to animal sanctuaries and pug rescues. Now, the other piece that I'm super duper excited about, two things, TDJ Soiree, which is happening on June 9th in Washington, D.C. This is going to be an all-day extravaganza. It's like a masterclass intensive that happens to have a tranquility pop-up, a swanky, yummy setting, vegan lunch, kale chips, all sorts of really goodness. I want a cocktail party and Lux goodie bags, et cetera, et cetera. So join the guest list for this, and tickets will go on sale next week. So I'm so excited to share this event with you. And thank you so much for your enthusiasm around it. I can't wait to be with you in this way. And then last but not least is Tranquility in Tuscany. So July 13th through the 20th, we are off to Tuscany. This is my second time to lead this retreat. And it's just a stunning setup, setting a private villa on top of a hilltop overlooking all these like olive groves and vineyards and forests. It's just really stunning. A pool and even the yoga room is looks out onto the pool. Like you see the inside of the swimming pool from the yoga room. Really cool. Anyway, oh, and also includes a day trip to Cinque Terre. So, which is like one of uh, the most stunning places in the world. Now, with this, the early bird special ends on March 15th. So if you're interested in joining us, be sure to grab your spot. And there are five left. 
Also, I want to say a big thank you to those of you who participated in Friday's giveaway, the Live Rosé giveaway that was over on Instagram. A big congrats to Sarah. And um, just watch on Instagram. From time to time, I put up giveaways. I also, of course, post them on the blog. So you can subscribe to receive the blog in your inbox. And that way you always know about what's going on. But thank you to everyone who shared how they live Rosé in their everyday. And I just want to share with you a few examples of what people had to say that I thought was just so, so sweet on ways they live rosé. So every time I put on my pink ballet shoes and dance my heart out, love that, sipping my tea slowly and reverently, cuddling with my pup, moving my body with joy, cuddling with pups, seems to be a thing, theme, um, singing songs for my favorite musicals by being kind and compassionate, always keeping fresh flowers in my home, knitting a few stitches every day, enjoying the small moments, stretching, bending, and breathing in essential oil, aromas from a diffuser. I'm with you, Teresa. Live Rosé by wearing vegan homemade herbal limp tent and sipping homemade fizzy berry soda. Love that, Barbara. So on on and on, there were so many really great ideas and suggestions and ways in which you live rosé. So thank you so much for sharing the ways in which you live rosé in the everyday. And a reminder that this t-shirt is available over at tranquility.com. The spring collection launched on Friday, National Pig Day, of course. And uh, you can find the Feminist t-shirt, the Wear Noir Live Rosé, plus six other brand new beautiful designs. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Jennifer Skiff is an award-winning journalist who traveled the globe as a correspondent for CNN for more than a decade. Passionate about animals and their welfare, she serves as a trustee, advisor, and spokesperson for charities around the world while working with lawmakers to create positive change. With her favorite Alsi and beloved rescue dogs, Jennifer spends her life in perpetual summer between Maine and Australia. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much for having me, Kimberly. I really, I I love everything about what you're doing in the world. Thank you very much. Well, I love what you're doing in the world. And you know what's funny? Rescuing Ladybugs, your new book, Inspirational Encounters with Animals that Have that changed the world. And you know what? I love two things. Ladybug was my nickname as a little girl. And then orangutans I'm obsessed with. And I'm like, oh my gosh, they're both on her cover. (laughs) Well, that's a nice nickname to have, isn't it? It is. It definitely elicits a a good feeling from everyone. You know, it's funny um, talking about that. People say, why rescuing ladybugs? And I've always said, you know, the, our parents taught us that when we were really young, when we rescued a ladybug, we should make a wish and, you know, blow her away to her, the safety of her home and her family. And I've spoken to people all over the world, and everyone had that story. And at that time, when we were young, we were being taught about empathy and compassion for even the tiniest of species. And so it just, while I was working on this book, that name just came to me and I thought, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Because the name itself makes you feel good. I, grown men, when I say rescuing ladybugs, they get a big smile on their face. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a very sweet, kind of delicate, compassionate phrase. Now, my curiosity for you is where did where did this book kind of come out of? Because there's so many people that you've highlighted and stories in this book. And I know you're a journalist, so I assume this took a lot of background and research and kind of work to pull all this together. Well, thanks for asking that. Actually, it really started, it, it was part of a, a two book deal, you know, with uh, my book, The Divinity of Dogs. And uh, the second book uh, from a publisher, the deal was it had to be a memoir. And I was like, a memoir? I don't want to write about myself. And I don't know how to write about myself in a way that would, you know, engage and enlighten people, frankly. 
Um, and then I started thinking about it and I thought about something in my life that changed me forever. I was in Laos or Laos, some people call it, and I was researching a book on the Vietnam War. And I was touring a cultural park. And I had a government minder with me and my boyfriend at the time, John. And the government minder, because I worked for CNN at the time, I had to have, um, it was a communist government, and it is, and I had to have someone with me at all times. I was walking around independently when John yelled at me, Jenny, don't come down this path. And of course I did. And what I saw was, was just absolutely debilitating. Um, there were about five bears and they were in like bell jar cages that they had all grown into. Uh, there was no room. They couldn't move. And I walked up to the one uh, the first one that I saw and he was crying and he had a paw in his mouth and he was rocking himself. And I just looked at him and we connected and he reached his paw out, out toward me and, and basically said to me, look, look. And I looked down at his paw and had all these red blisters on it, like bad blisters. And I asked the minder what was wrong with his paw and he asked the zookeeper and translated came back to me. That's where people put their cigarettes out. When I heard that, when, when I heard that at that moment, John said to me, Jenny, let's go. You know, you can't save every animal in the world. And while I understood what he was saying and from his perspective, I could not look away from the situation. And I knew that if I moved forward, I, I just felt I had no choice. I, and I knew that I could do whatever I was guided to do. I, long story short, um, 24 months later, after getting help from friends who donated money uh, from uh, animal welfare experts, uh, bear experts, after uh, convincing the communist government to work with me because I told them, if you want tourists to come here and have a good time, you know, in your compassionate Buddhist country, <laughs> let's show them some compassion. They gave me some land and we built the first bear sanctuary in that country. So leading into that, a lot of people love that story and a lot of people know me from, from doing that. But I started thinking about that and I started thinking about um, I'm an animal welfare advocate, so I, I lobby it in Parliament in Australia, where I live part of the year, and I lobby in Washington when I'm there for animal welfare. And along the way, I have met so many amazing people. I just started contacting them and saying, did you have a moment? You know, these people are heroes in the world for animals. Did you have one moment? And of course, funny enough, they all did. And so it really wasn't hard to compile these stories because I am lucky enough to call a lot of world leaders in the compassion movement, my friends. And uh, that's how I compiled the stories for this book. Everything from orangutans to mantas to chimpanzees to pigeons to pigs to chickens. Can we talk about orangutans? <laughs> that would be of a great segue. Um, and by the way, thank you, because, you know, whenever you do come across those things, particularly in different countries, I mean, of course, we see it in the U.S., but this stuff is often hidden away. I mean, not always, but often. And, um, you know, whenever you see this stuff in other countries, it's horrifying. And it's so hard to figure out what to do. So I love what you were able to do for these animals, you know, it's huge. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it's, uh, it is, it is one thing to see things on the social media. Um, and it's another thing to experience them firsthand. Um, it's debilitating. And as you uh, use the word horrifying, it is, it is horrifying. It's the stuff that gives you nightmares. And um, so yes, orangutan. So I contacted Willie Smith. Willie had, um, He's up in Borneo, Indonesia, and 
he is a uh, he was a Dutch forester when he went to Borneo to work, and he had met a gal, and they were having children, and he was carrying these kids through a market one day when a man came up to him and had a baby orangutan in a cage, and he said, you know, buy me, buy buy the baby, buy the baby, and he just walk past the man. But as he was walking past the eyes of this baby orangutan connected with him and he connected, but he kept going. He got home. He said, I just wanted to get in my air conditioned car and get out of there. It was hot, horrible, steamy, smelly. He got his kids home and he could not get those eyes out of his mind. And he went back uh, at night. And he looked around the market and he heard this wheezing, and he looked over at a pile of garbage and the baby orangutan had been taken out of the cage and thrown on top of a pile of garbage as trash. So we went to her and he picked her up. And he started to walk with her when the man came out from underneath the table and said, give me money, give me money. And he said, he just, he just kept going. He wouldn't give him any money, just kept going, got in the car. And when he got home that night, to make matters worse, his wife said, don't bring that filthy animal into the house. So he had to spend the night outside trying to get this baby, bring her back to life. And he did. And as he started to raise this orangutan, word got out and someone gave him another baby orangutan. And he realized that, you know, he had children. He had toddlers at home. He realized how similar they were to human beings. So what he did is unbelievable really, um, because he's up in Borneo where, and and I know your website mentions this because you're very connected into this and knowing and understanding what palm oil does. Um, You know, palm oil being uh, so valuable that that the forests up there that the orangutans have lived in forever are being chopped down and with them, the orangutans are being uh, killed and then the babies sold off oftentimes. And we're participating in that with the palm oil by buying anything with palm oil. But I digress. (laughs) Uh, The story is a beautiful story about one man and his quest to protect orangutans. And he doesn't do it just by rescuing them and re-releasing them into forests that could ultimately be cut down again. He has found a way to recreate a tropical rainforest something people didn't think could ever be done. And I'll save all the details for for the book because it's so incredibly interesting how he was able to do this. And he saved over a thousand orangutans, but now he puts them into habit that it habitat that is protected. But more than that, he sets up jobs uh, for the local people and positions them around this habitat so that anyone coming in who wants to try to destroy destroy the habitat illegally it meets with opposition from the people who actually are earning an income based on the crops that have been planted around these forests. It's a beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing. And, you know, there's such, as you said, like, you know, recognizing the similarities between orangutans and his children. I mean, what's the DNA makeup? I know with chimps, isn't it like 99% of DNA? It's like the same as humans? Good question. I don't know the exact fact of that, but uh, yeah, I can't answer that. Unless I Google it. (laughs) It's okay. It's just we're very similar. We'll just stay there, you know. We are very similar. Yes. Um, And tell us about, just because, you know, of course, I'm obsessed with orangutans and um, pigs. And then, of course, you know, cows with Temple Grandin, you know, she's always kind of interesting. So can you speak a little bit to these two stories in your book? Uh, Well, as far as Temple Grandin goes, I, I thought it was important to have her in the book. Um, a lot of your people would know her. You know, she's um, 
you know, there's been a movie about her. She's infamously known as, as being an autistic woman who has created uh, sweeping change for animals in the cattle industry. Um, I thought it was important for this book, uh, and because despite the fact that her work has been to um, help cattle who are being led to their deaths, the fact is is that uh, many, many, many millions, if not billions of animals just in the U.S. alone are killed every year uh, for meat. And there was a problem and she saw it and she created change that made the life um, for animals who are, who are raised for slaughter uh, a moment uh, a little less stressful. Uh, she had a connection with she was working in the cattle industry and had a connection with two calves and realized uh, herself uh, that they were seeing, thinking, feeling animals. And, you know, her quote to me was that it, it, she would, you know, I have dogs knocking at my door right now. That's always interesting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've closed them out for this interview and they're, they're knocking on the door. Um, very funny. <laughs> um, anyway, she has, um, uh, I've lost my train. I've lost my train of thought. I no problem sorry about that. We can um, edit that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, she's you know she's unique. Uh, she had a connection with cattle. Uh, she's a bit controversial, um, but she did tell me that you know she wishes for a world where people don't eat me. And I thought that was very interesting coming from someone who has really uh, made a living working in the cattle industry. Yeah, and you you had started to mention too about the two calves, right? So she had a she she was working um, doing uh, journal journal work and magazine work uh, for the cattle cattle industry and uh, talking about you know what's going on and reporting on reporting on it. And she was at a stockyard and she formed a relationship with two calves. And I think in, in their pen, there were about a hundred uh, cattle in this one pen. And she noticed that, she, that two were very, very playful with her, connected with her, had a relationship with her. And that affected her very, very deeply. And she realized that they did have feelings. They were sentient beings. They did have personalities, and it was one of the things that truly motivated her to create change in the industry because, as she puts it, it was very, very, um, uh, well, not so gentle. Let's just put it that way. You know, when uh, it's all about numbers, it's all about time, when you're moving animals, uh, slaughtering animals, getting animals dipped. Um, it was all about that and not about common sense. They weren't using common sense to, um, deal with cattle. So, yeah. So I put her in the book because I thought it was, her story was very interesting and, and it was a little bit out there and it was something that a lot of people haven't heard. Mm -hmm. They know about her. They know about the work that she's done in the world but they didn't know about her connection. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's helpful. And and clearly, you know, she has seen things that have inspired her to do the work she's doing, even though she is a meat eater, it's like becoming, you know, making that connection and being able to say like, I ideally would like to see a world where people don't eat animals. You know, I think that's a pretty profound statement. It was very nice to hear that from her. Let's talk Sadie. Sadie, Sadie the pig. So, yeah, so I live in Australia part of the year, and I'm very, very fortunate to have a sister-in-law who owns a winery in the wine country of Margaret River. It is a beautiful place. At dusk, over the vines, the kangaroos come out, they eat grass in front of you, and beyond that, you watch the sunset. Um in front of the Indian Ocean, it's it is a beautiful experience. 
So I go down to this winery very uh, often when I'm here and enjoy the the experience. And one year I noticed that the farm manager, the winery manager, had pigs uh, at his house. And so I'd walk by there every morning and got into the habit of meeting all these pigs. And one of them was named Sadie. And, you know, I'd go back every three to four months and I'd notice there would be all the piglets were gone and Sadie was there alone or another four months later, there were more piglets. There was another larger pig. And then, you know, about a couple of years passed, I guess, and Sadie one day I went and she wasn't there because, of course, the manager said he sold the piglets um, for food. So I was kind of upset. <laughs> you know, I had a relationship with her. I I went up and I fed her and I talked to her and I pet her uh, and she wasn't there. And I really panicked. So I started asking people what happened to Sadie. And I was told that she had been put, the manager moved away and he had been given a t- an area to put her in temporarily. So I went running to this area and it was far from the idyllic little, the pen that she had been in, which was really quite beautiful and lush. It was a dry patch of dirt and, and that's all it was. And there on the corner of it were um, some drip spigots. There wasn't even a bucket of water because it's so hot there too as well. You know, it would dry up if, if you would put a hose. There was nothing, just drip spigots. And I was really upset. So I, you know, took a shovel, whatever. Long story short, I tried to build her a, um, a mud bath, couldn't do it. And as I was walking around, the outside of her pen uh, working on these spigots. There was a stick in my way and I picked it up and I chucked it into the pen and she chased it like a dog would chase a stick and she brought it back to me. I thought, that's, that's strange. And so I got in the pen and I started throwing the stick and she was so happy because she looked so sad. You know, when I got there, there was no greeting. She was all alone. And so I, I'd throw the stick. And, and anyway, long story, I just, uh, we had a beautiful connection. And to me, she taught me everything about how close, close she is to being so much like a dog. You know, the, those animals that we share our life with in our house. She was smart and she was fantastic. And other than humongous size, you know, I would have adopted her in that moment and had her come home with me. Uh, But she did, um, she did get moved on and, and, and was uh, saved from that horrible destitute place. I couldn't let that happen. That's for sure. So her story's in the book. Very, very sweet, very sweet animal. Yeah. They are so sweet. And I think I read that they're the four smartest mammal, mammal after like, Humans, dolphins, uh, I mean, is it elephants? No, something. But I was like, um, sharks, chimps, maybe, maybe. Mm. sharks. Yes, yeah, there's a lot of great smart ones out there. But I was like, oh my gosh, they're so smart, and they really are. Mm. Um, You've had relationships with pigs. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm like obsessed with pigs. Mm-hmm. I kind of stalk them, mm-hmm. and it's funny at sanctuaries. You know, I go and I'm like so excited, and they're always like they they run away from me because I'm like too much, you know. But um, there was one little piglet that I I <laughs> met when he was young, so I could like you know kind of mold him. And uh, his name was Walter, and I was obsessed with Walter and. You know, he had fallen off a transport truck, which happens so often. It's horrible. It was on the highway. Someone rescued him, you know, kept him in their house for a couple of months and then, you know, transported him to the sanctuary. So he was very much not a pig in the fact that he didn't really understand the other pigs. He was very, very much about humans. And yeah, I used to go visit him a lot. He was just the sweetest. And you'd say, Walter, and he'd come running and he loved animal crackers. And yeah, I <laughs> loved that little pig so much. And it's funny because when I went to the sanctuary, it was my first visit. And she was like, oh, I have a surprise. And I'm like, oh my God, a 
piglet, you know? So, yeah, yeah, they're amazing beings. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. But yeah, they don't seem to I like wish everyone could just experience that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because a lot of people too that are into animal rights or welfare, they've never met a pig. I'm like, how can you not have met a pig? You know, it's like such an experience. Well, I like to, I like to say to people, you know, um, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, you know, take your kids to a farm sanctuary because they, it, I know there are petting zoos and I know Ugh, animals yeah. are often brought to parks and, and things like that. Look, you really get it when you're at a farm sanctuary. You really get it when you take the time and also, you know, to volunteer at a farm sanctuary is even better because you really understand the personality. It's just like those people who work in dog shelters. They get dogs. They get it. They, they're compassionate hearts. They're wonderful human beings. Um, it's the same thing when you go to a farm sanctuary and you sit down with a pig and or a sheep or, or or even a cow and you get it. It you uh, allow yourself to have the connection and it changes everything. Yeah, I think the piece too about looking into their eyes. You know, there is you see someone looking back at you and the eyelashes on the pigs. It's like, oh my <laughs> gosh, they're gorgeous. <laughs> Um, so let's talk compassion, right? So compassion, I think, is a particularly kind of weaving in Buddhist philosophy, right? And, you know, there's a wonderful yoga mantra that I love, loka samasta suki no bhavantu, which means may all beings everywhere be happy and free. And so how do you feel that compassion is a way to help people connect more with our animal, our furry friends? Well, thanks for asking that question. And I think it aligns with everything that we're talking about right now. I've done some research and, you know, the majority of people in the world consider themselves compassionate people, but a lot of them um, don't, don't get or understand the animal rights movement or when people call themselves vegan, they, they don't understand that. And they, especially when, uh, those who exploit animals work very hard at um, making those people out to be villain, villains, you know, animal rights people or vegan, which they're not. They're just compassionate people who have a lot of empathy and, and get the big picture. So I've, um, in this book, really, I'm trying to coin the phrase, the compassion movement, as the collective quest to alleviate suffering for all forms of life because I can tell you everyone who I talk to believes that, that they are compassionate people. They want to be on board and they are on board as, as was just proven uh, recently uh, by the votes in Florida and in California, the elections um, to end greyhound racing and to end uh, the extreme confinement in California of uh, veals and hens and sows. This is, this is, these were compassion votes. They were bipartisan votes. And they, they made a very big statement, which is that people understand compassion and they get it. They don't want other beings to be hurt under any circumstances, really. So, I'm just moving forward with that compassion movement because I feel people can get on board with that and they understand it. Yeah, what happened in California and Florida is amazing. And what was so great is a friend of mine on Facebook who I don't know to be an animal person. I mean, she has a dog, but you know, other than that, I know she's a meat eater and, you know, that I've never heard her um, express any interest in kind of animal rights stuff. And she actually posted about the farm bill. And, um, and I was like, oh my gosh, thank you so much for sharing this. And she was like, it's actually, you know, one of the main reasons I'm voting on Tuesday. And I was like, oh my God, I love you. I love you, you know? So it's funny. It's like sometimes, you know, when people, they just, the more they learn, I think, or the more we learn, you know, the more we can, um, y you know, shift towards a more compassionate mindset and, and outlook. That's, it's nice to hear. And, you know, especially on issues like that, too, um, who, if, if you do eat meat, 
who wants to eat meat that, of, of animals that have been tortured? You right. Know? I mean, right. just knowing that would make you get you to the voting booth. <laughs> yeah, know? and the cra- no one wants to be no one wants to be involved or associated with that. Right, and the crazy thing is, is that ninety nine percent of farmed animals are factory farmed. I mean, that's crazy. It's horrific. It's horrific. Yeah, and yeah. you know, it's amazing of- that a very few people. It's amazing that a very few people in this world made uh, created something so extreme and so horrible, and that the rest of us. Uh, and they, they kind of slipped it by the rest of us, you know, for such a long time. Um, and now, luckily, and thanks to your friends and my friends uh, who are out there leading the way on these issues, uh, the tide's changing because people are, you know, it's being revealed to people what, what actually happened. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, no, absolutely. And kind of speaking of tides changing, you know, what do you feel like for our listeners, kind of the average person can do in his or her life to improve the lives of animals? Hmm. Well, thanks. I, I, I think personally, there, there are a few things that you can do every day. Uh, when you're, you can set aside, even if it's five minutes or 10 minutes, uh, on social media to go ahead and like posts and share posts and definitely, definitely sign petitions. It takes less than 60 seconds, especially petitions from large groups that have a proven track record of uh, creating change, like the Humane Society of the United States or Animals Asia, uh, Animals Australia. Uh, these groups work very, very hard at creating change and they've gotten their powerful force. Uh, so there's that. There's, of course, a lot of people tell me they can't go into a dog shelter or a cat shelter. It's too debilitating. Well, guess what? Donate some money, donate towels, blankets, have fun drives, go on Amazon on their wish list and go ahead, you know, spend 50 bucks. It really, really makes a difference. And then the other thing truly is I suggest please understand and don't participate in acts uh, where animals are exploited. So, you know, dolphinariums and uh, places, you know, there's a story in this book from uh, Rick O'Berry, who is a dolphin trainer. And uh, he was one of the first dolphin trainers. And now he works to, to end the practice. Because he explains, you know, the animals are starved to do tricks. And that's what he says. And it, in his story, it's really eye-opening. So, you know, when you can go ahead and take your family on a vacation and go whale watching and see animals in the wild or go to national parks and see animals in the wild, why would you pay to participate? In cruelty, you know those roadside zoos. That's just that cruelty in its uh, purest form. Uh, so yeah, you know you don't want your kids one day to say, you know, people have said to me before, uh, you know, when we were young, uh, our parents took us to the circus, and I always got upset when I saw the animals. And you don't want your kids in this day and age to say, you know, can you believe my parents took me to? Uh, Sea World or or wherever. And uh and you know, there were animals in concrete pools that should have been swimming out in the wild. So that's my take on it. Everybody has their own take on it, but and I know SeaWorld has made um some amazing changes. But I travel the world a lot and I've seen dolphin areas and that is basically a swimming pool where a, a dolphin or two are kept. And then they just die, and then they just replace them. It's really bad. There's there's no standard of care. So every place is a bit different, but really make your choices. Right, right. No, I think that's a great reminder. And, you know, from entertainment to what we eat to what we support, um, great reminders. And, you know, my last question for you, Jennifer, kind of ties in with the name of this podcast, of course, which is Tranquility Du Jour. So this idea of finding tranquility in the everyday. And I'm curious for you as a journalist, as an activist, 
um, as a dog mama, you know, it's like, how do you find tranquility in your everyday, particularly knowing so much about what, you know, the suffering that's going on in the world? That's a great question. So before this podcast, I, I, I went swimming and I had a really good workout. I often swim when I'm in Maine. I swim in a mountain lake with friends every morning for about a mile. And when I'm here in Australia, I often swim in the Indian Ocean. And when I'm not doing that, I do some Bikram yoga, which always makes me feel kind of high for a couple of days after I do that. And the most important thing to me in the world is just getting down uh, on, on the same level with the dogs. I, I spend probably two hours at least a day um, just alone with the dogs. I shut off my phone. I take them to the park, uh, the dog park, and I just sit there and, and, and laugh, you know, and I just laugh. I just watch them have a good time and I get absorbed in that. And that, that's how I find peace in my life. And when it all gets too tough, you know, I crawl into bed with a big bag of potato chips and I watch um, happy movies and happy TV shows. And then I get back up and start at it again because we all have a purpose here. And part of that purpose is not to look away from things that we know aren't right. So you do have to take the time to keep yourself peaceful and calm because you can't advocate for animals. If you're angry and upset, you have to be a voice of reason. So thanks for that question. Really great question. Thank you. And thank you so much, A, for the work you do, B, for this amazing book you've put out, which, you know, sharing all these different stories, it just allows us to have connections to these different animals. And, you know, thank you for the, the work that you do. I really i am so grateful. My pleasure. And right back at you. And from all my, all the one-eyed dogs I've ever had, we send our love to Gizmo, your pug. <laughs> Thank you so much. So you can find Jennifer at jenniferskiff.com, S-K-I-F-F. Also on Facebook at Jennifer Skiff Author. On Twitter at Jennifer Skiff and Instagram at Jennifer Skiff. Also, over in the show notes, KimberlyWilson.com slash 446, you'll also find links to my new book, Year of Tranquility. Also, eye candy, ways to find me over on Instagram where I confessed that I had a big Thin Mints fail over the weekend. Now, honestly, I can't stop thinking about Thin Mints. Um, Also, you can find me on Pinterest, which I'm on occasionally, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Also, there's a link to the Tranquility Collection, which is our locally sewn, vegan, seasonless, eco-friendly clothing line, all about slow fashion because everything is made to order. You can also find a link to my six books, Tranquility Field e-courses, the podcast app, and then read about my passion for animals, which is why I was so excited to have Jennifer on the show. Finally, if you have a moment to pin a review on iTunes or share this podcast via social media, would be so grateful. And then also, if you have a moment to pin a review of any of my books on Amazon or Goodreads. I really appreciate you being here, and I hope you have a delightful week ahead. Namaste. Thank you.